In this section, we're going to talk about file permissions. Linux has a fairly straightforward set of file permissions. There's only two kinds of users, really. So there's only so many permissions combinations that have to be created. You can see the permissions on all files by running ls with a long listing. I run ls-l. If I run this command on Etsy, I see the permissions of the files and subdirectories. I can break down the information in the first column in the following way. The first character is the file type. Regular files have a hyphen. Directories have a D. Symlinks have an L. And there are some other special types for system components you might encounter occasionally, but if you want to go looking for them, they're in slash DEV. The next nine characters represent the actual permissions. Each of three types of users, owner of the file, the members of the group that owns the file, and everyone else on the system can have a combination of read, write, and execute access to any file on the Linux system. The final dot represents the context for SE Linux, which is another topic entirely. Two of the file permission types, read and write, are pretty self-explanatory. If a user can read a file, they can see the contents but not make changes. If a user can write to the file, they can alter the contents of the file. The execute piece is a little different. For regular files, the execute means that the file can be run as a command. It is required to be set so that a script or another program is runnable by the appropriate users. For directories, the execute permission has to be set so that users can change into the directory and access files below it on the system tree. So you see the number of my directories here all have execute permission for all users on the system. Then there's some that have to be protected that actually don't have execute permissions for the other users. So for this particular directory, sudoers.d, the owner has read, write, and execute. The group, which is also root, has read and execute so that root users and anyone belonging to the root group can CD into the directory. And the rest of the users on the system have no access whatsoever. Permissions to files are altered using a couple of commands shown to change the owner, chgrp to change the group, and chmod or chmod to change the overall permissions mode. So if I'm in my home directory, I can create a new file with touch file 2txt and that'll give me an idea of how some of these things actually function. So if I look at the default values for the permissions on my new file, I see that the file owner and group have read and write permissions to my file. The rest of the users on the system can only read the file. The setting that determines these default permissions is called the UMask, and it's set in the system configurations in Etsy. I can see what my current UMask is simply by typing UMask. The default UMask may vary from system to system, but is usually set in some combination of full permissions for the file owner maybe include write permissions for the group, and probably only allow read or execute for the rest of the users on the system. It's encoded backwards. The numbers used to represent the UMask are what's left over after the granted permissions are subtracted from a total of seven points. Reading the file is worth four points, writing the file is worth two points, and executing the file is worth one point for a total of seven. If I want to allow all permissions to a particular type of user, I represent it in the UMask as a zero because I've subtracted all the things I want to allow. If I want to allow read and execute, I represent it as a two because I've subtracted four and one from seven. It's a bit confusing. Luckily, modern Linux systems also allow for the UMask to be represented as symbols. If I type UMask dash capital S, I'll see the decoded UMask broken up for U for the owner, G for the group, and O for all the others on the system. And then the permissions represented as R, W, and X. The UMask determines what permissions a file will be created with. I can also use the numeric or symbolic methods to change the permissions on a file that's already present on the system. So the files I already have in my home directory, I've got file and file2. And if I want to remove the group ability to write to the file, I can use the command chmod g minus w file dot text. I now see that one file here, file two, does not allow the group to write to it. So I've changed it from its default value. If I want to start treating the file as a script or an executable program, I have to add executable permissions to that. I do that with chmod plus x. Let's change the file dot text. 
And you can see the differences here between file two and file. So this one now has all these execute permissions. In addition, your terminal may have some color coding on it that turns your executable programs green. There are other bits of information in the long listing from LS, particularly the owner and group for the files. If I want to change who owns the file, I use chown, or I can change just the group with chgrp. So I'll create a file in temp, which is a system directory that's world writable, and I'm going to do that as my local user. So I'm going to touch temp file3.txt. And then I verify its owner. There we go. It's owned by my current user. As a regular user, I can only change the group that owns the file if I am a member of that group. The super user, however, can change the group of the file to any group configured on the system, so we're going to use sudo for this example. Your system probably has a number of pre-installed groups on it, but let's change the file3.txt to be owned by the root user and the root group. So I do that with sudo chown root colon root, so user colon group, and then the file, and that's been updated. I can change the group that owns the file to be a group that the owner of the file isn't necessarily a member of, though that's not normally something you do. But for an example, to use chgrp, let's change the group owner of the file back to vagrant. So I do sudo chgrp vagrant temp file3.txt. Take a look at that. You can see that that's been changed. I can grant my regular user the permission to write the file. I already have it here now because the group is vagrant and the group permissions includes write. So if I open my text editor, I can add some stuff, save it, and that's all okay because my user belongs to the group that owns the file. Okay, so you have two kinds of ownership. You have the user ownership, which in this case is root, and the group ownership, which is vagrant. So any of the users that belong to the Vagrant group have access to write to this file. You may want to read up more about how your particular site sets UMasks because they often get changed to be a little bit more restrictive than the system defaults. Depending on how your organization is using Linux, you may find that your UMask is set pretty tightly. The manual and online documentation will have more discussion about how you can actually change these and affect some of the defaults on the system because it's different in different releases and in different distributions as to where you would actually set those changes for existing users and for newly created users. There's going to be a couple of places in slash etc where you want to make those changes. Thanks for watching this O'Reilly training video. If you'd like more information on this topic, click on learn more. Don't forget to subscribe to the O'Reilly Video Training YouTube channel for more tutorials and be sure to like us on Facebook.